So now that you know a bit about some of the common mechanisms that Java provides to do parallel programming, let's talk a bit about the history of parallelism support in Java over the past decade or so. And this is really from the 2010 timeframe to today. And we'll also talk about the evolution of Java from its initial focus on concurrent programming, which has really been from the beginning, the spring of 1995, to more parallel programming, which is what we have today. And I'll talk about why that transition has taken place. And it's really quite interesting to see that transition occur. So the foundational support for parallelism occurred in Java in the Java 7 timeframe, which was around 2010. And that was when the fork join pool was released. And if you recall, the fork join pool provided fine-grained, object-oriented data parallelism. So fine-grained, because you could split things up into little small chunks. And it was object-oriented, because the things that you were splitting up were, were based on inheriting from classes and overriding methods. And you're doing data parallelism. The data is being partitioned up into little chunks, into subtasks, and then run in parallel. And this basically uses that split apply combine model we talked about to run the same task on different elements of the data. So this is basically a, so, an object-oriented software variant of single instruction multiple data, which is a classic hardware level parallelism that has been around for decades. So this is the same sort of idea applied to software. There's an example you can take a look at if you're curious to see what it, how you program these kinds of things called the search fork join example, which uses the common fork join pool to search the works of Shakespeare to find quotes from the works of Shakespeare. If you know much about the works of Shakespeare, you know Shakespeare used a lot of cliches in his work. That's a joke. He came up with the cliches. Uh, he came up with quotes that people turned into cliches. But uh, this little program goes off and searches the works of Shakespeare to find quotes. It's really kind of fun. And it definitely shows the performance speed up of embarrassingly parallel techniques for doing uh, text processing. The good thing about the fork join pool is it's powerful, it's scalable, but it's a bit tedious to program directly. And the reason why it's tedious is because you have to inherit from uh, base classes or super classes and override methods. And it's kind of a white box form of reuse. You have to know sort of the structure of the classes. And you can't leverage the various cool support for functional programming features easily when you program with the object-oriented fork join pool. Therefore, to address those issues with, quote, modern Java, which starts with Java 8 and continues up to the future, I, I guess at some point we'll have post-modern Java uh, if they get far enough along. Maybe, maybe Project Loom will be post-modern Java. They have Java parallel streams and completable futures. And the initial focus with parallel streams is on fine-grained functional programming frameworks for data parallelism, so you get the benefits of the fork join pool model, but with a nice functional programming veneer wrapped around it. And then there's also support with completable futures for asynchronous parallel processing, which is yet a different model altogether. So here's a very simple example that you can see if you go and look at this particular file. This shows how you can use parallel streams to synchronously download images that aren't already cached from a list of images, and then basically apply filters to transform the images, and then store them all in parallel. So all this computation takes place in parallel. And when we get to this part of the course, you'll learn to love to read this kind of code. It's really cool. There's also a way to combine streams and completable futures to be able to asynchronously download images, and then asynchronously process and store the images in parallel. So this is a slight variant of this approach. This is an asynchronous way of doing things. And we'll, we'll cover this when the time is right later in the course as well. And you'll get a chance to experiment programming both this type of approach with parallel streams and this type of approach with completable futures for the same type of problem. Later, more recently, in other words, the last maybe four or five years, reactive programming models, frameworks have come out, RxJava, Project Reactor. And they allow you to be able to do asynchronous streams processing, which is arguably a little bit cleaner than this sort of thing where we combined streams and completable futures because these abstractions were really meant to work together in a fully asynchronous way. And so this is doing the same sort of thing, 
and uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So we'll, you'll get a chance to play around with this stuff as well as the other things too. I won't try to explain all this stuff right now, but it's really neat. One of the things I will mention briefly though is the cool thing about modern asynchronous programming in Java is it looks relatively linear in the programming abstraction, even though the processing is taking place concurrently or in parallel asynchronously. So the code uses this, what's called fluent interface model of chaining together a bunch of operators or operations. And then as things complete, the next operator or operation in the chain gets called back automatically to process it. That's very interesting. And again, it takes a little while to get your head around it, but it's really cool when you understand the programming abstraction. The Java frameworks are designed to strike a balance between productivity and performance. We talked about that before. It's easy to get performance at the expense of ease of programming, productivity. It's also easy to get productivity at the expense of performance. Striking that balance is tricky, and I think they do a good job of that with Java. The downside, however, is sometimes these frameworks can be overly prescriptive. They have a particular programming model that they're trying to, uh, trying to focus on, trying to uh, incentivize and promote. And so if your problem doesn't quite fit into that model, it may be a little bit harder, but it works for almost everything I've ever come across. Let's talk briefly about the evolution of Java from concurrency to parallelism. There's a nice talk by Brian Getz. I mentioned it before. He's the chief architect or a chief architect for the Java platform. And he has a nice talk about the evolution of Java from concurrent focused abstractions to parallel focused abstractions. And the main point he makes is that we ran into this problem about a decade ago where the performance that was predicted as we had more and more cores was growing much faster than the actual benefits we were getting from our modern processes. And the reason for that was it was very difficult to program all these cores using the traditional object-oriented programming abstractions, like classes and threads and built-in monitor objects and various types of locks and so on. And so his point was by moving to the functional model and the data parallelism model, it becomes easier to program in a way that will take advantage of cores. If, of course, you have algorithms that lend themselves to parallelism. Not every algorithm is a parallel algorithm. But a lot of things today, especially things like data science and machine learning, are fairly embarrassingly parallel. And so you can get a big speed up if you use the right abstractions. So his point was we, we had to move this way in order to get a, a better mapping between what we would like to have based on all the cores we've got and what we can actually achieve in practice. There's also another good talk by a guy named Rob Pike. Rob Pike is, uh, I think he works at Google now, but in the, the old days he was heavily involved with, with Unix at Bell Labs. He was also a championship archer of all kinds of interesting things. And he talks about the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So this is a good video to watch if you want to know why concurrency is not parallelism. And in a nutshell, to spare you from having to watch the whole thing, if you just want to know the, the punchline, he talks about how concurrency is about dealing with a lot of things at once, trying to coordinate and synchronize and so on, whereas parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. And that's, that's a pretty good definition. There's other ones I like perhaps better, but I think that's a nice, succinct way of talking about the difference. If you think about concurrency, it's really about coordinating and synchronizing and and making sure things interact properly, whereas parallelism is about getting rid of interaction and doing things in parallel, using embarrassingly parallel style decompositions to do divide and conquer, so you don't have to share any mutable state, whereas concurrency is more about dealing with shared mutable state. So that's the end of our quick summary of the history of parallelism support in Java.